We are live. Um, so uh, this is our veterinary neurology question and answer session. Uh, we've got me, Dr. Wong, and we've got Dr. Seneca from our Jupiter location um, here to answer your questions. If you've got questions about neurological problems such as intervertebral disc disease, seizures, paralysis, degenerative myelopathy, meningitis, balance problems, that sort of stuff. Uh, that's what we know about and we uh, hope to answer your questions and help your pet as much as we can. Um, the, the caveat there is because we're unable to see your pet in person, um, we're somewhat limited in what we can answer and uh, how much advice we can give. But again, we wanna help as much as we can. So um, please put your questions in the comments and we'll do our best to get to them. But today we have a bunch of questions uh, already lined up. Um, the first one is with Janine. She has a five-year-old pointer, uh, an English pointer named Tule um, that has seizures and has some questions about medications and what to do. So hello, okay. Janine. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Of course, of course the dog. Is that I, Tule? I think somebody's here. Um, probably a <laughs> It'll be, this will be easy for you, I hope. Um, obviously, Tule is my dog. She's actually gonna be five next week. She, um, just kind of a brief history. Quiet. Back in November, uh, November 15th, she had a seizure. I took her to the vet and we both were really convinced it was probably from a neurotoxin. She was the day before diving under a head. She grabbed something out and swallowed it before I could get it out of her mouth. Next day, she had the seizure. So we said, okay, we'll keep an eye on it. On January 14th at one in the afternoon, she had another seizure on my sofa. I brought her back to the vet. Um, she did give me I forgot the generic name, the intranasal Valium, you know, in case it happened again, got her out of it, brought her down there. They ran some blood work, looked good. They did the heartworm test. Everything came back fine. At exactly 12 hours later on January 15th at 1 a.m., she had another seizure. And again, intranasal Valium, finally got her out of it. It took quite a while. And I ran her to the ER. They admitted her, they kept her on, uh, they started the phenobarbital. And my follow-up was actually just a couple of days ago. So it was her four-week follow-up. Blood work looks great. Um, phenobarb levels are 22, so that was great. Uh, and um, So we're gonna keep her on the phenobarbital, but I just, actually the vet was wonderful and spent an hour with me. A lot of questions I had, she answered them. There were two things. Um, she said, oh, if you're gonna do that Facebook Live, ask them. <laughs> and actually I'm right up in Port St. Lucie. So um, it was at the ER up there. Anyway, so the first question we started talking about quite coincidentally, before her second seizure, she was just starting to come into heat. I wanna say maybe a week, week and a half, I kind of noticed she was starting there. Um, and she actually started bleeding um, on the 25th. So full, blown, you know, now she's in full blown, but she was just starting at the time. So my question was to my vet was what do, what role do hormones play in causing seizures as a trigger and would a spay help? So that was question number one. And question number two that we kind of went round and round and round on was heartworm prevention. Obviously she needs to be on something. And I'm terrified now uh, because of, you know, could it be she also just had her heartworm uh, prior to the seizure. And one vet um, that I went to previously with her first seizure said, one of the neurologists that comes up here said, she'll only use revolution. This vet was thinking we could stay on heart guard. So she said, oh, ask them. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the hormone question, first of all, um, there's not a ton of literature out there about hormones and, and how they may, you know, affect dogs that already have an underlying seizure disorder, you know, for Tule, you know, it, it, 
given her age, her breed, you know, we're probably dealing with, with epilepsy, but without, you know, kind of further diagnostics, we don't know that yet. Um, if, now, have, is she a breeding dog? Uh, no, but I do put her in the show ring. Okay. Um, you know, so I think the general consensus is that we probably would recommend staying for these dogs, especially females. There's probably a little bit more literature out there to, to suggest that the estrogens may play more of a role. Um, and obviously spay down the road could, could help prevent other, other metabolic problems, you know, pyometras and things like that that can yeah. be helpful for her. So um, I think our, our thoughts are that it's unlikely to, be, to, to negatively affect her to spay her, and it, it certainly may provide better seizure control in her lifetime. Um, and as far as the heartworm prevention, that, that's definitely a, a big question. And, you know, I think for me, there's so many products out there. I, I can't even keep track of them anymore because it seems like all the time there's, there's something new on the market. Um, in my experience, heart guard has been safe. Um, we, I know Dr. Wong has mentioned he stays away from some of them. Um, so things like Trifexis, which, you know, even in the packaging has made a statement about, um, potential seizures in dogs and, um, I think, what, did you say Brovecto, Dr. Wong, or? Uh, oh. Yeah, that's one of the other ones that I, you know, just kind of steer clear from. Yeah, but but there really there really are so many products that it is very hard um, to, to, to keep track. Um, but HeartGuard, I, from what my experience, if, if she's been on it, um, it is probably one of the safer options for her to stay on. Okay. Now, you'd mentioned... Um, short of doing some other type testing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I have no problem. I could run to Jupiter, I could run to Miami, I could, you know, um, is there anything easy to do that maybe the vet could do or should I bring her to a neurologist? To, to, to for what purpose, to, to, to reach the diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so the way we approach seizures in dogs is is we do kind of first want to rule out that the toxic or metabolic things, and it sounds like with the kind of repeated nature here, it seems like toxin is is very unlikely. Right. Um, and if blood work has been done and her liver and everything all looks okay, um, then a metabolic problem is also unlikely. So the next steps that we tend to recommend are things like MRI of the brain, just to make sure that there's you no know, sort of structural abnormalities and you know even a, a five-year-old could unfortunately have have a cancer mm -hmm. the only the only abnormality we may see is a seizure and they may actually have a totally normal exam otherwise so um mm -hmm. doing that to make sure we're not dealing with something else and something much more serious um and checking their spinal fluid to make sure that there's uh, no evidence of a meningitis which is also quite common in in younger and even middle-aged dogs um, with how long ago her first seizure occurred, um, meningitis is, is going to be a lot less likely here. Um, but, you know, at five with a large breed dog, um, we can never take away that possibility of, of a tumor in there. So it's always good. You know, negative tests are actually good information. Oh, that was interesting. Okay. Because I know there's no family history on either side. Um, so everybody's kind of shocked over this happening. Yeah. Yeah, so so the the quote unquote simple tests that that can be done at your primary care veterinarian, you know, things like blood work, things like X-rays, you know, urine tests, etc., et and that sort of looks at, like Dr. Seneca was saying, the the things outside of the brain, the the metabolic stuff. Um, but but the so answering your question of what can your vet do, we we love when vets do that stuff first. Um, then to look inside of the brain, it would be the MRI plus or minus spinal tap. And quite frankly, the best thing would be that we do that and everything's normal and that way we can say, yes, definitively Tule um, is, is an idiopathic epileptic, which would be the best reason for the seizures. Okay, yeah, because everything so far, all the testing has come back picture perfect. Yep. Good. Okay, thank you, I appreciate yes, you it. Do you have any other questions? Nope, I'll probably be getting a hold of one of you. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably the closest to you. Yeah, yeah you, you are certainly the closest. Closer. I don't want Miami traffic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, so, Janine. Thanks, Tula. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, it looks like uh, Mary and Lucy are, are here, but just while we're while we're waiting, we've got a little bit of time. Um, We've got a question here from Melissa. It says, I've been doing my research on French Bulldogs. I plan to adopt one later this year. 
I can't help but focus on intervertebral disc disease that they may develop. It just breaks my heart. I was watching one of your YouTube videos and found it very helpful. Um, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube, am I allowed to do that? <laughs> please, please go ahead, check us out on YouTube and uh, subscribe and you'll get all of our amazing informational stuff. Um, what you guys do is amazing and I'm sure the Frenchie owners out there are so thankful for all you do. Um, I was hoping if possible you could give a nervous, soon to be Frenchie owner some tips on how to avoid IVDD from happening. Um, she'll be adopting a puppy, so anything that can prevent this can most likely be taught early on, such as no jumping on furniture, use a ramp instead. Is there anything else I should do in the early stages? I just want to be the best dog mom I can be and appreciate any help you can offer. So I guess if you can talk a little bit about intervertebral disc disease and common question of how can we try to prevent it. Sure. So we, we wish we had the, the magic trick to, to prevent this entirely, but unfortunately we don't. Um, however, a lot of the things that you put in your in your question there um, are are excellent things to do. So exactly what you said, you know, training a dog right away to to use a ramp um, is potentially one of the one of the biggest things that that you can do to help. Because we always worry about um, these pets jumping kind of off of high surfaces, so jumping off of the couch and jumping off of the bed and landing on that kind of solid surface on on the ground that could cause uh, potential potential injury. Um, having the dog wear, wear a harness um, instead of a neck collar so that when they're walking, you're not tugging on the neck because the, the disc problems can happen in the neck and anywhere uh, down the back. So kind of having them on a harness uh, instead. Um, also involving the, the cervical spine is kind of reducing the, the tug of war types of play. Um, a lot of that rough housing, which really can, can tweak their neck and, um, you know, so many dogs are, are ball motivated or frisbee motivated, but possibly just keeping on the ground so they're not jumping super high to, to get get that ball. Um, those are those are the big ones. So you it sounds like you already uh, know kind of what what you're you're getting into and, and Frenchies of course are very, very high energy dogs and, and need a lot to keep them keep them busy. So um, you know getting puzzle toys and other things to to keep them occupied um, are are really good things. Yeah, I mean, they've certainly become our number one breed that we see in, in the hospital. Um, you know, Dachshunds used to be kind of our, our classic intervertebral disc disease dog, and um, Frenchies, in, in, in my experience, have it just as much, but we also see French Bulldogs that get other neurological conditions. They get brain tumors at a relatively young age. Um, they can get inflammatory CNS disease, so meningitis, encephalitis, et cetera. Um, even the young Frenchies might get some malformations in their vertebral column that sometimes can cause neurological deficits. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that, you know, we recommend pretty much for any Frenchie or, or dachshund owner is get pet insurance, you know, if, if, if you can, just the sorts of conditions that these dogs get and the, the costs associated with them and just the likelihood of them getting it, uh, getting one of these conditions is relatively high in the breed. So um, if you can get pet insurance, that's uh, something that we certainly recommend. And certainly to, to get that before, you know, as soon as you get the pup, the, I don't know if it's an adult or a puppy, but um, it's, it's, it's a better idea to have it, have it right away than to wait for something to happen. Uh, we'll, we'll do one more question from the comments before we jump to, to Mary and Lucy. Um, Jesse uh, is, is a doxy dad, has a seven-year-old dachshund that has elevated red blood cells. Um, is there any correlation between the elevated red, red blood cells and seizure activity? What can I do about it? So um, last week, we, we kind of talked a little bit about uh, Jesse from a spinal standpoint and does it have anything to do with intervertebral disc disease or back problems? But uh, I don't think we really answered anything about uh, seizure activity. So um, J Jesse, can you, can you put in the comments because you're, you're actually pretty pretty good at, at putting stuff in there. Do you know how high um, of a red blood cell count your pup has? Uh, D David just commented, yes, get insurance for your doggies. Uh, Jesse says he has uh, ASPCA insurance for, for his dog, Jasper. Uh, 68, so 68% um, is is uh, Jasper's hematocrit, it looks like, Dr. Seneca. 
So uh, there are a couple of breeds where elevated red blood cell counts is actually kind of normal for the breed. Um, so, and dachshunds are, are one of them. So dachshunds and greyhounds kind of are our primary breed where uh, we see kind of normal numbers in that range. Um, could there be a correlation to seizure activity? I, I have seen dogs have um, seizure type events with very, very high uh, red blood cell counts into the high 70s um, and even even 80s. Um, but for a dachshund, um, I wouldn't be as concerned just because they do tend to normally have higher uh, higher numbers of red blood cells. Yeah, so um, I've actually never seen a, a dog have seizure episodes due to polycythemia. I've, I've had a couple cats, um, certainly can happen. Um, you know, it's a, a little bit, yes, in, uh, yes, it's in our realm and that it's causing seizures, but most of the time internists are the kind of experts in, you know, treating elevated red blood cells and, you know, the different ways, whether it's, um, wh wh whether it's drawing the blood off, whether it's, uh, you know, medications, et cetera. So um, I, I would get a internal medicine uh, consultation um, to, to see what can be done about the, you know, elevated red blood cells and are they actually a problem? Um, probably not related to, I'm, I'm going to assume Jasper had seizures before all of this. Um, he went from one seizure to three seizures a month. Okay. So, um, I'd, I'd, I'd have a veterinarian check it out. Um, an internal medicine specialist, uh, might be of, of use um, for, for this sort of question. Um, it says he's got one for next month. Fantastic. Yeah, and I think it would be good to kind of look back in, in um, Jasper's history and see is this, are these numbers kind of a historical normal or is it a new, a new problem that the numbers are high? Yeah, definitely. All right. Mary, you're here with us now. Hello, how are you? I'm Hello, Mike, Dr. Here. Wong, and this is Dr. Seneca. You've got a uh, a 14-year-old uh, lab husky shepherd mix named Lucy that, uh, were these her first two seizures three weeks ago or have we ever had seizures before that? Yes, no, no seizures. Um, she's on a raw diet. She, um, I was bragging, this dog has never needed meds. Um, however, she had vestibular in 2017 and okay. 2019. And my vet and I decided that it was probably triggered by Brevecto. She also had heart guard in close proximity. So I just eliminated the two and she had no problems. That was May, 2019 until three weeks ago. She had um, two, one seizure. I rushed her to the vet and he said, let's just wait and see if it's a one-time deal. And um, it wasn't, we got home, she slept. Um, both times when she, she woke up that morning and had the seizure. And then later in that afternoon, she took a nap and woke up and had a seizure. She recovered pretty well after both seizures, but the second one was worse. I'd okay. say about two minutes each one. The second one was more violent. So he called in Keppra. She's on 500 milligrams of Keppra three times a day. That's the only med she's on all these years. And um, acid reflux she's had. So we give her Pepsid 10 milligrams two times a day, but that's pretty much it for this 14 year old dog. She hikes, she's, you know, an amazing creature. <laughs> so help. Um, my questions are, um, is the vestibular and the seizure related or is she just prone to neurological issues? Um, my vets, I have two of them because I'm in two states. We're in the White Mountains right now and Massachusetts. I have a Dr. Wong also in Massachusetts. He's wonderful. And um, he, they both think they're leaning towards a slow growing brain tumor and my other vet in Maine said it could be late onset epilepsy, but it's not common in a 14 year old dog. He did a neurological examination, both did. After the vestibular, the Massachusetts vet said she was flipping her paws fine. Um, neurologically, she seemed okay, but weak in the hindquarters. This vet after the seizures, the back paws didn't flip very well, especially the right one, her right eye, wasn't responding to blinking when he did the reflex. Other than that, organs look good, heart looks good, blood tests look good. Um, how, how long after the seizure was that exam where, where she wasn't reflipping the, the back right leg? I mean, was it was it kind of a couple yeah. hours after or was it a couple days after? A couple of hours, but okay. I am 
I try it and it still doesn't go. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. yeah, so those are my questions. What, what do you think? Um, and how do we know? I'm petrified that another one's going to come. It's been three weeks and three days. And so far, so good. She's back to normal. She's a little wobbly, more wobbly in the hindquarters. Um, and, you know, before the seizures, she was pacing. She was saliv what do you, saliva, lots of saliva right. and anxious. And now I don't know if it's the meds or if that was the beginning of what happened. So any advice, any treatment? She's on good supplements from both vets. Um, that's it, just the Keppra. Great. Um, so just a couple of things, because because you had said that um, you know everything else checked out normal, blood work, all of those things, and I see a comment about you know age and a concern uh, for an MRI, and and I guess that's kind of my question back to you is is um, because it is very hard to predict. You know, you're asking about when would she have another. It's kind of hard to predict her future here with without knowing because some of what you're reporting does make us concerned that there may be um, a tumor or a mass because she she seems to have some other deficits um, with possible vision and uh, what we call proprioception is where you're flipping that paw upside down. Um, so uh, that obviously would be the, the only way to know for sure what's going on. And even though she's, she's 14, uh, we certainly anesthetize geriatric dogs uh, and cats all the time. Um, and, and that's why we do the other tests and we do the blood work and do the chest x to kind of make sure it's safe to do so. So um, I, I wouldn't let her age um, steer you away. Um, it's it's certainly um, still an option to, to get her imaged and see, is there something there that we need to worry about? And um, because there might be other options still for her um, beyond just, just seizure medication. Um, and absolutely, uh, geriatric onset or late onset epilepsy is, is always possible. And I think the more we scan elderly patients, the more we, we actually realize that not all of them have tumors. So, you know, maybe her, her deficit in her back leg is, is an old spinal injury or, or something like that. So, um, so as far as what you're doing, it sounds like she's responding very well to Keppra. It's very good for minimal side effects. Um, you might be seeing that increased wobbliness just because of the fact that she got a new medication, um, and that often will subside uh, as they kind of get used to that that drug. Um, supplements, I don't have a lot to uh, to talk about. There's there's nothing that I've found that really uh, really helps. You know, we always get the CBD question, and it's kind of a, a buyer beware situation with that. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not interested in CBD. I do do the curcumin and the turmeric, and, okay. and the omega threes. Ash of the vestibular really helped her. Omega three oil. Her coat got better. Her energy got better. I rehabbed her um, with walks and um, play with, and she really responded well. She came back great from the vestibular. Amazing. Yeah. And Amazing. so to your, your question about are they related? It's probably unlikely that they're related because the, the time frame here doesn't fit. The first vestibular was you said 2017, and another in 19. 19. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So now we're in 21, and, and for her to have you know kind of worse than a tumor, there are very few cancers that will. Kind of progress over the course of three or four years um, in, in a dog so um, that's a very long time in the life of a dog and we tend not to see cancers move that slowly um, mm -hmm. so i think those were kind of isolated um maybe kind of the the, the old dog vestibular type of events that do get better very quickly um, and i think this is a new problem okay and dm has been mentioned by um my other my one dr wong vet mm -hmm. um yeah, so he had mentioned that after the vestibular, but I wasn't sure if he was seeing the remnants of the vestibular because I did kind of rehab her back from that, and he was shocked. He was shocked at how good she looked next, last time he saw her before the seizures. So DM, does that cause seizures? Or? No, so degenerative DM or de degenerative myelopathy is, is kind of primarily a spinal cord problem, and it's a, a very slowly progressive process where we start seeing kind of one back leg, one one leg will start to drag the toes and then slowly the other leg and they'll get wobbly and weak over the course of around kind of nine to 12 months before dogs can't walk anymore. Um, so seizures are, I've never heard of uh, or seen a dog that has seizures in relation to DM. I, I would always assume it is not, you know, it is just a separate problem. 
Okay. Okay. Um, anything to look for before, sh should we, before upping the meds, here's my husband's question. Should we just wait till the next seizure? I mean, how do you do that? How do you know when she might need to up the meds or, and one, one vet wants to do the MRI and the other vet says no. So we're in conflict with that. Well, I, I think the tiebreaker there will be you and, and how much you, you want an, a definitive answer here. Um, and regarding the medication is if she is happy and normal seizure free right now, there, there's no need. I mean, I don't know how we, we kind of dose based on their body weight. And so I don't know what her exact weight is. And I, I can't tell you if this is the, the dose that I would personally start. Um, but I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't just increase, um, if there's no changes. So if the seizures start to become more frequent, that's when we start looking at increasing doses and potentially adding additional medications. Because once you reach a point with dose changes of one medication, you're, you're gonna get more side effects and less clinical benefit. So we often will just add in, you know, a second drug or even a third drug in, in some cases. Okay, okay. So pretty much keep doing what we're doing and just hope for the best? Yeah, and, and the, the, the biggest factor too is if, if this is epilepsy, she won't have any other problems, other signs. Um, it'll just be seizures. But if this is a, a tumor growing, you will probably start to see some other changes. So a change in her behavior at home, a change in her mentation. She might start these compulsive types of behaviors like walking around in circles or kind of going into a corner and, and staring at the wall. So um, weakness uh, or, or dragging those legs. So, so you might start to see some other changes that clue you in to say, okay, this is not just, you know, a seizure disorder. Okay. Okay. So, so staring into space, things like that. Cause she's yeah. very alert, very alert. What about yeah. the eating and the drinking? Um, she, she's always been great at both. Yeah. Um, it got a little obsessive right when she started the Kepra, but it's leveled off. I mean, she was like grabbing at the food mm -hmm. and now she's back to her. Is that normal? Yeah, some some seizure medications will will increase appetite a bit. I haven't seen a lot of that with with Keppra. Um, what I've what I've learned is I, I no longer use appetite as a marker for deterioration in, in a dog per se. So it's, it's kind of hard to explain. So a lot of times I would say, well, if a dog um, stop, you know, wait till the dog stops eating, and then you know something something's really serious. But um, dogs with brain disease, uh, especially, I've seen dogs with tumors, they will just compulsively eat. Um, so okay. Okay. You know, those are kind of waiting, okay, well, she's still eating, she's still eating, um, but some of these other signs might be getting worse. And, and that's why I say, don't, don't use the appetite as the only thing to, to keep her going. Um, because if you're starting to see decline in other ways, that that's much more concerning. Okay. Activity. Should she be limited to any activity? Keep her doing what she's doing. I, yeah, I mean, especially if she's being supervised, um, you know, I would keep her away from the top of the steps. Um, so that if she has a seizure, she doesn't tumble down them, you know, keep her off of the, the bed if, if she's unsupervised, but certainly she can go for walks and runs and play. Um, if she swims, I would be a little cautious about that. Um, but no, she doesn't, she certainly doesn't need to be confined. Okay. Okay. Good. I think we're good. Acupuncture. My last question. Can't hurt. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot to add. I guess the, you know, the one thing that I, I wanted to, to touch on where you'd kind of said, you know, one vet wants to do one thing, one vet wants to do the other. And, and I, I agree completely with Dr. Seneca's, you know, our, our job as veterinarians is to, you know, guide you, give you pros and cons, you know, make a recommendation. But in, in, in the end, you know, you're her best advocate. And, you know, I, I try and coach owners through well, what's keeping you up more at night, you know, not knowing what the problem is or the downsides of doing MRIs, because there are downsides, you know, things like costs, things like anesthesia, et cetera. Um, I, I agree completely that, you know, age is just a number. If we're otherwise, you know, running around happy, healthy, our, our blood work looks good, our heart sounds good, you know, we, we don't look or act like a 14 year old dog, I wouldn't necessarily let the number, you know, there, there's no cutoff that at 14 and three months, it's an absolute, you know, no anesthesia. Um, I, I I sometimes tell the story. You know, it was uh, gosh, good good seven years ago or so. But I had a fourteen year old German short haired pointer that came in had had two seizures. Dad wanted to do uh, an MRI, and you know, otherwise was a, a healthy dog. 
Um, we ended up finding a brain tumor in that particular dog. We did surgery, took the brain tumor out. Dog lived to be 16 and a half, never had another seizure. So, um, right. and, you know, I, I know it's all scary stuff. Hey, my dog's 14. And that's a reason that people don't like to pursue tests. And it's completely reasonable, but it's not an absolute. Uh, same thing with, you know, concern for, well, gosh, if I find a brain tumor, you know, am I going to do surgery on a 14 year old dog? You know, again, it depends. It depends on the dog, depends on the, the tumor, depends on the owner. So, um, so I, I guess if I were you, what I'd be thinking about is, you know, gosh, what can I be doing now? You know, do I want to find out more or not? What can I be doing now with regards to all of the questions you asked, you know, what to prepare for, and then what to think about in the future, like you asked about, you know, symptoms I should be looking for, um, you know, increased weakness, changes in behavior, acting blind, or increased number of seizures. Increased number of seizures do doesn't necessarily mean that it's a brain tumor. You know, even um, epileptic dogs, their seizures can increase in frequency and severity. But um, those would be the things that I would be looking for and things that would prompt me to say, yeah, we should be doing something different, whether it's shifting to do an MRI, whether it's increasing the Keppra. And I, I agree at this point, you know, if, if things are okay at this starting dose, um, I, I don't see a, a big reason to, to increase anything. Okay. The anesthesia scares me a little. Sure. Um, you have a tight trachea. And the other thing would be um, the inoperable tumor. Um, how, is there any way without the MRI of knowing where this could possibly be that you've seen that's common with what I've described or what you've experienced, where this tumor could possibly be in the brain and if it would be operable, I know I'm asking you to do the unknown, but. So with seizures as her only, you know, kind of problem right now and maybe that deficit in the, in the back leg where she's not flipping her paw over. Um, seizures kind of suggest uh, what's called the, the forebrain or the more front part of the brain. Um, in, and so but as far as kind of where in that area uh, that we, we really can't predict. We can often say okay, maybe left side versus right side based on the exam. Um, but operable versus not um, based on exam alone, no. So um, when we're making that decision, we're, to, we're looking at the MRI and saying, is it kind of on the surface of the brain where we can reach easily and not disrupt normal tissue? Um, or we're looking at something that for the brain uh, where often surgery is not recommended, but we do uh, talk about things like radiation therapy. Yes, yes. Okay, I researched all this. So if it's in the front of the brain, it might be operable, possibly, mm -hmm. just to yeah. there, the, okay. And um, I have one more question. I can't remember what it was. I think that's it. You sound like me trying to remember your questions. I do yeah, that all the time. I had a good one too, and I can't remember what it was. It had to do with uh, what I've read about the uh, being in the frontal. I, I studied, I looked that up. Um, all right. Guess that's it. If, if it comes to you, feel free to pop it in the comments, and uh, we'll do our best to to get back to it. If we don't get back to it on the live thing, we'll you know we'll message you. Great, thank you so much, both You're of you. Welcome. Appreciate it. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, Heather has a question. Um, she has a two-year-old German Shepherd, um, and I, I'm reading that as two is not as opposed to twelve. Um, took a nap, woke up and could no longer use her back left leg and tail. Um, the veterinarian diagnosed a fibrocartilaginous embolism, prescribed crate rest for three weeks. She was doing better, but now the back right leg is showing issues. And then uh, Heather put another comment of, um, what should I do next? Could this be the start of degenerative myelopathy? So, um, um, so this is probably very unlikely to be the start of degenerative myelopathy. Um, that is almost never an acute problem. Um, and we also tend to see it more in dogs, shepherds that are about seven, eight years old as opposed to two. Um, so I think uh, that is not an issue right now. And then, um, so with the concern for an FCE, we would expect for her to just kind of um, gradually improve and not have a setback. So it is a little concerning that now her, her other side, the, the right side is showing some issues. So. Um, maybe, I guess, I don't know, did, did she have an MRI or he have an MRI? Um, I, I, I don't think so. 
kind of presumptive, um, which is very, you know, it's, it's not a, not a, a wrong thought because we, we very often see just kind of one side much worse than the other with, with FCE. But I do you know, worry, was this perhaps actually a, a ruptured disc that kind of went off to, to one side more than the other? Um, and maybe the, the meds and the rest that she was on did help alleviate some of that, you know, pressure. Um, but now, because when, when discs rupture, oftentimes there's, there's physically disc material there underneath the spinal cord. Um, so could it be that that's what's happening and got through kind of the initial phases of, of discomfort and inflammation, um, but there's still something physically there. So, uh, yeah. that, this is, uh, I would say this is absolutely a case where since we've had a setback, um, we, we definitely would recommend more advanced imaging to see if, if there is something there and, and can we can we do something about it um, to, to take that away and get her better. Yeah, Heather, I see that you're responding relatively quickly in the, the comments. So um, what, what was your dog painful when this first started? And um, so did, 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 did your dog act painful when kind of woke up and wasn't using the leg or tail? Uh, she said no x-rays yet. Which type of doctor should I see next? So um, I'm, I'm going to go with probably hasn't had an MRI. Um, so, so Heather, the questions that I would have if you were here and, you know, me, me trying to, uh, she says no pain at all. So to, to me, the hallmarks of a fibrocartilaginous embolism, you know, we classically see that. Uh, and for those that don't know what that is, it's a, a spinal cord stroke. It's where a, a little bit of disc material makes it into the blood supply and blocks off the blood supply to the spinal cord. So um, for me, the four hallmarks of an FCE are it's a, acute and onset. So it comes out of nowhere. Um, so that that's certainly uh, what you're describing. It's usually non-painful. Sometimes it's painful right when it happens. But usually by the time you make it to a vet, they're not painful. Um, non-progressive so it usually doesn't get worse with time so that's kind of one of the things that doesn't really fit with what you're telling us and it's asymmetric it usually affects one side of the body much more than the other so um you know up up until you started saying things like well uh now the right side is getting affected um it certainly sound like it could have been an fce what we wouldn't expect with the fce is getting worse so um either Either it's that we're not truly worse and maybe you're just, um, you know, your dog's compensating for it. I guess that would be one thought. Um, two, it wasn't an FCE to begin with. Or three, your dog's developed a different condition. Um, it's kind of my thought process at all. Um, and Heather says, went from um, no reaction to not walking. I, um, not, 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 not sure what you mean there. If, if, if you mean it just came on. From, from normal to not walking. But um, to, to answer your specific questions, uh, I, I don't think this is, well, I'm comfortable in saying this is not the beginning of degenerative myelopathy. Um, which type of doctor should I see? So if your dog was dragging the limb, you know, standing on the top of the paw, couldn't use it, couldn't use the tail, that certainly sounds like a neurological problem. So that would be the the sort of specialist that, you know, I would lean towards. Um, your veterinarian, you know, that, that, that you took her to has the luxury of, of seeing in person and saying, yes, this sounds like a, a neuro problem. But um, if they were concerned about it being an FCE, certainly sounds like they were more worried about a neuro problem. So um, I'm not sure where you're located. There is a website called um, vet specialists with an S.com. And basically you can put in there, you know, where you're located and, you know, I'm looking for a neurologist and they should, you know, kind of tell you everyone in a hundred mile radius of you. So, um, so we have a, a question from a, a veterinarian here. Um, dilemma that, that Ryan often gets uh, when managing IVDD conservatively, um, particularly dogs with neck pain, um, is do I reach for steroids versus non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? Uh, great, great question and a common question. Um, do you have a preference or? Uh... Personally, I tend to be a steroid person um, over an NSAID, and I think this is a very, you know, common. It's you're either kind of one or the other. But in situations where dogs have been on NSAIDs. Um, and are doing well, like continue NSAIDs. If they've been on NSAIDs and things are not getting better, 
um, then I often will transition and it, it goes kind of the other way around too. Um, the, the biggest thing with steroids is, is proper dosing. So what I've seen in the past are our dogs that are receiving far too high of doses um, to treat because with, with disc disease, you know, what we're the goal of treating um, with steroids is to treat inflammation. Um, and so what we don't like to see is when dogs are receiving kind of immunosuppressive uh, doses that, that just kind of cause more side effects and they're not really targeting inflammation. Um, so as long as doses are conservative and the rest of the, the patient is, is healthy enough to be receiving steroids, I, I don't find a problem with it. I guess the, the small concern I have is um, when we're not dealing with disc disease um, and sure. you know, we haven't confirmed it, there's always that chance, especially in, in kind of you know, younger dogs, is could this be more of a meningitis type of situation? And uh, that's where steroids can affect our diagnosis uh, and definitely can can alter the results of a spinal fluid analysis. So uh, that's the, the small concern is if we don't really know and if it's if it's not quite fitting the bill for a disc, um, sometimes we have to wash them off in the steroids and um, you know perform potentially a second spinal fluid uh, later on and see if the results differ. Yeah, so so Ryan, I, I don't have a. I mean, we, we get this question all, all the time. It's actually in in one of my you know frequently asked questions uh, l lectures, and and there really isn't a you know for all dogs do this or in all dogs do that. So you know, I I don't have a um a, a strong recommendation that you should always reach for steroids or always reach for non steroidals, um, or that one is bad or anything like that. Um, I. I I guess seconding all the things Dr. Seneca said, you know, the, the things that I factor in um, are, I guess, what's the likelihood of it being a slipped disc? You know, sure, if it's a seven-year-old dachshund or something like that, you know, we have a relatively high degree of suspicion that it's intervertebral disc disease. Um, but uh, I guess we need to be asking ourselves, well, if it's not that classic breed, um, classic age, et cetera. Uh, I, I guess another factor I, I like to take into account when people, when veterinarians call me is just, what's the likelihood of one, the pet coming to see me and two, the likelihood of them doing tests. You know, if it's something that they, uh, the, the veterinarian says, yep, you know, th th this owner wants to do diagnostics and they can come right now, I often say, hey, don't, don't start steroids because it might mask, um, th like Dr. Seneca said, the do, doing spinal taps, et cetera. And, you know, I, I realize it's not always that, that black and white um, of yes, I can go right now or, you know, or no, I absolutely cannot go. And I kind of just try and gauge the person, you know, is it better than 50% chance that in the next three or four days you will want to go see the neurologist, you know, and or do tests and sort of gauge things from there. Um, so uh, I, 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 <laughs> I'm 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 channeling L L Lucy here. I, I had a third thing to say and I can't think of it right now. Um, so uh, I guess Dr. Seneca, can, can you talk when when you say steroids? I know you had said anti-inflammatory. Um, I guess do you have a preference? Can you talk a little bit about injectable steroids versus oral steroids? And then within oral steroids, um, do you have a preference on steroid A versus steroid B versus steroid C? Yeah, so um, with injectable steroids, I mean, it really, again, kind of depends on, on what I've found. I, I, I would say I rarely, if I, if I see a dog and I, I think it's a herniated disc and the dog is still eating and drinking and otherwise fine, I, I very rarely reach for injectable steroids. And if I do, um, I, I tend to go for uh, like dexamethasone, dexamethasone SP. Um, and I personally don't ever give any more than, than 0.1 migs per kg of, of DEX SP. Um, certainly you can do the, the PRED equivalent. Um, so with, with oral steroids, I, I tend to use prednisone or prednisolone. Um, and in that range of a, a half a milligram to one milligram per kilogram per day. And I personally tend to split doses um, twice daily just to make it a little easier on them. And um, unless an owner says to me, there's no way I can medicate my dog twice a day. And then I just you know do the whole dose. Um, and I often will taper um, and taper fairly quickly too. So, uh, you know, either every three days or every five days, taper them off, um, you know, a month full of steroids is, is probably not going to be too beneficial for the patient. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I was getting at. And, and we, I, I feel like I get the question a lot less now of, of you know, solumedrol and, um, you know, I, I, I have never given solumedrol. I was kind of taught, you know, of, of that camp of, um, 
saw you measure out as it was falling out of favor. So um, you know, I, I don't know if that's a common thing in Australia still, Ryan, but um, don't use a lot of solumedrol. We, you know, if we go injectable, I, I tend to use Dex SP or dexamethasone as well. Um, and then I, I orally prefer prednisone over, over anything else. Um, there are a couple studies that suggested that dexamethasone versus anything else, you know, dexamethasone is more likely to cause urinary tract infections, um, GI upset, et cetera. So. And I will say on, on the NSAID note, um, I've recently been seeing a lot of patients come in on, on Galaprant, um, which to my knowledge has really only been labeled for osteoarthritis. And so I, I do, I'm always curious if, if that NSAID is, is a good choice for these patients or, or not um, compared to the ones we're kind of more used to seeing with you know, Rimadil and Deramax, um, Meloxicam. So I feel like Galaprant is, is definitely out there you know, in, in a lot more frequency than it used to be. Yeah, definitely. I'm seeing it a lot more. So I, I, I don't have an answer for it. Um, you know, is it better work? What, what, what I know it's labeled for. Um, Lauren has a question. She's got a uh, 12-year-old, almost 13 year Maltese, had uh, ventral slot surgery in December of 2016. He's blind, diabetic, and started to become off balance this past December. A um, few days of pain. We assumed it was a flare-up of IBDD. Treated conservatively with meds and um, and exercise restriction. Initially had some front leg crossing, and it continues occasionally along with balance being unsteady, particularly from waking up. Just wondering, else could it be? He doesn't have any proprio. Uh, ran out of it there, but it doesn't have any proprioception. I don't know if that's going to say doesn't have any proprioception or doesn't have any proprioceptive deficits. Um, scheduled to see a neurologist next week, but at 13, we don't plan to do surgery and don't want to put him under an unnecessary stress. Another dog with lymphoma. Um, we've, you've got a lot going on in your, in your household right now. So, um, I guess, can you give any sort of insight, hope, or, uh, um, recommendations for Lauren Ann? Yeah, so I guess the you know, first question I have, because you were saying, oh, could it be something else, is, you know, number one is, is the diabetes well controlled? Because um, that can can cause some, some neurologic problems. Um, not what you're describing as much as, you know, some others, but just kind of making sure that that's, that's under control. Um, if the pet is still walking, I, I certainly wouldn't feel pressured to be you know, needing to, to go for another MRI and another surgery, um, because those are dogs that, that certainly can do quite well with conservative management. Um, and in this case, and so this is kind of a nice segue from, from the last conversation is this is a case where I, I would not recommend steroids because of um, the fact that the pet is a diabetic. And so the steroids are really not a, a great idea in those patients. So um, perhaps a non steroidal medication and some pain management if, if the pet's uncomfortable. Um, and physical therapy, I, I feel it could also be very beneficial um, even without knowing what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think your best bet is, you know, you've got an appointment with a neurologist, they're going to be able to see in person because I, th I think a couple of different times you said, you know, being off balance or losing balance. And yes, sometimes, you know, people say losing balance when it's just in coordination. But as a neurologist, when we hear balance, we think of the balance system, the vestibular system, which, which is very, very different than the spinal cord of the neck um, in regards to what are the possible causes. If, if we start talking about balance problems, all of a sudden surgery isn't even something that you know we're, we're talking about anymore. So um, I strongly feel your, your best bet, you've already got an appointment with a neurologist. You know, as, as long as your pup is, is stable and can wait to the appointment next week, that's that's where your answer is. They're going to give you a hundred times better advice than than we can give, you know, from however far away we are from each other. Um, yeah, I totally agree. That definitely, they'll be able to check if any of the kind of vestibular functions are are abnormal, if it or if it seems more likely related to the neck. Great. Um, going back to the the steroids question. Oops, I must have clicked on it twice. Um, Doctor. I'm not sure why it's not staying up there, but uh, D Dr. Strauss is asking, what sort of prednisone dose do you do for seizures with suspected brain tumors? Uh, literature says anywhere from a quarter to two mg per kg per day. So um, I, I guess why don't we answer it in the 
um, I guess first in a diagnosed, we've done an MRI and you know diagnosed a brain tumor um, when you're using steroids there. And then how about in that dog that we haven't diagnosed, but is that 14 year old boxer with seizures and you know walking in circles to the left and blindness on the right? So I guess for me, it doesn't uh, really, the answer doesn't really change because um, I still go for uh, an anti-inflammatory dose, which for me is no more than one milligram per kilogram per day. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, will decide based on the body weight and the tablet size, right? So you want to make something work well. Um, so I would round down if it fits better to, to do, you know, five milligrams or 10 milligrams, but um, definitely, I, I would probably not go under a half a milligram per kilogram, um, but I certainly don't exceed one milligram per kilogram for, because to me, the two milligrams per kilogram per day is getting into your, your immunosuppressive range. Yeah, d d definitely. I, um, I, I go half mig per kg, um, BID to begin with. Um, so one mig per kg per day is, is what I would be using as well. So and for me, if, if we had that MRI, we know there's a lot of you know, perilesional edema around a tumor, I would probably you know, start with that one mig per kid per day for, for three or four days uh, or five days and then, and then taper down pretty quickly. Okay. Awesome. Um, we've got some pre-submitted questions that I, I know I always forget to get to. So uh, Emily's throwing stuff at me right now to say, don't forget Patsy and uh, Sandy has questions. Uh, Patsy asks, is it safe to use a muscle stimulator on my paralyzed dachshund? She'll be eight in May, has been paralyzed since June 2019. She's trying very hard in good health other than paralysis, um, was just checked by her veterinarian in February. So um, the, the, the question is, um, in a paralyzed dachshund, um, permanently paralyzed, is it safe to use a, a muscle stimulator um, for the paralyzed dachshund? So I, I guess... And does, is it, does it mean, is the question regarding like a, a TENS unit or? That, that, that's how I'm reading it, of, of using a TENS unit for muscle stimulation, um, uh, presumably to maintain muscle mass um, as opposed to any sort of pain management or, um, uh, or, or trying to regain function, I guess is how I'm reading it. It's just, is it safe in general? But yeah, maybe if you want to comment on, I guess, w w where a TENS unit might be useful and I guess what we're going to get from it and what we're not going to get from it. Yeah. I mean, so in general, yes, I, I think using a, a tens type of unit is, is safe for somebody who's trained to, to apply that to, to a dog. Um, but in this situation, you know, I, I don't think that the goal is going to be to regain function um, as far as voluntary motor function or the ability for her to walk again. Um, it's going to be more for, um, as you said, kind of maintaining muscle mass. Yeah, so so pr pr probably safe, you know, use under the direction of a, a, a veterinarian. Um, but but yeah, it's it's not going to um, likely make your doxy walk again, assuming that we were you know completely paralyzed, no feeling, et cetera. Um, but un under the direction of a veterinarian uh, shouldn't have any downsides. Uh, Ramsey's um, three-year-old Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Um, hello, my name is Sandy. I'm from Latvia. I follow your page, listen to your question and answer event. I have a question. My dog Ramsey's um, Staffordshire Bull Terrier had an injury and herniated disc in August 2019. Um, he was 18 months old at that time. One of his rear legs did not move. We went to the vet. They did a CT with my allogram and diagnosed a disc herniation at T12, T13. Um, they discussed surgery versus a non-surgical route and they chose the uh, non-surgical route. It's been a year and a half since then. We've done physical therapy, acupuncture, hydrotherapy, et cetera, but still does not completely control the leg. He walks relatively well, but has a limp, cannot scratch with his foot behind his ear. When he walks, he raises his foot too high and hits the ground. So, so still some residual co in coordination in that uh, back left leg, I, th I think it was. Um, so um, he, when he lies down or gets up, he seems to still feel some discomfort. 
um, but his legs still seem to be the same size, seems active and happy. Question, is there a chance that the nerves in the spinal cord will recover? Does it make sense to do an MRI to see what the condition of the spine is? Um, could it be that the nerves are still compressed because sometimes I see that he has some discomfort? I don't know if he's in pain because it's a dog breed with a very high pain threshold. So um, so injury a year and a half ago sounds like we're improved but have some residual deficits. Um, question, should or it, it, will the nerves, will the spinal cord recover? Um, do I do an MRI now to see what the spinal cord condition is? Um, could there still be residual compression? Uh, those are the three main questions. So first question is, is there a chance uh, for recovery? I say there's always a chance. Um, dogs can recover from remarkable injuries and sometimes that just takes a very long time. Um, and regarding doing an MRI now, um, that would be very helpful because yes, we could see if, the, if there was a lot of um, this material again that that stuff tends not to dissolve or go anywhere um, so we may see that there is physically still quite a bit of something there that is pressing on the spinal cord but what it would also be able to tell us is um, is there kind of scarring within the spinal cord so something that we call gliosis because if that's the case then we'd be more likely to say that um, he's, there's probably less of a chance of him having further improvement than if there isn't any um, changes inside the spinal cord. So um, I guess doing the MRI for me would be more to see the, you know, what does the spinal cord itself actually look like? Because I'm, I'm not sure um, in this, it, it's kind of a tricky question of going into surgery a year and a half later. Um, that can be a really challenging procedure uh, that, that long down the road. Yeah, so I, I guess to me, one of the big things is how much have, have we recovered? You know, if, if you say, hey, he's 90%, you know, but but isn't normal yet and and, and we're staying there and, and it's not like we're trending back down, um, you know, to, to me, that's a, if there was an FCE or a slip disc a year and a half ago and we've improved, we're walking, we're comfortable, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how much more I'm going to be able to to help. Um, I do think the the I agree the the MRI is going to give us a lot more information, tell us the likelihood of will there be further recovery. Um, but yeah, just so just like you said, I'm I'm not sure of um, you know I'm not not excited about if there's a slip disc of of going in uh, af after that surgery. I, I guess the other piece of um, information is, is he painful or not? If, if you told me that, yeah, he was still painful, you know, that would change my tune completely. You know, if, if he's still having, having pain a year and a half later, um, that's something that, you know, I just feel the need to, 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 to help with. Um, yeah, it so. does, in that, in the note there, we, I do see, seems some, seems to feel some discomfort when getting up or laying down. So, yeah. um, so, all, all depends on how severe the discomfort is and is the discomfort coming from the back or is it coming from, you know, knees, hips, joints, et cetera. Um, and, 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 you know, th th this is uh, one of those things where it's just so hard for us without seeing the dog in person, being able to, to talk with you and kind of ask questions. Um, that, that's where it becomes challenging for us to give a, a great answer. Um, we've got a couple more minutes. Um, So th there's a question here. How do you decide where the neurology signs seizures arise from? Um, and and, and, and th that's the primary thing that neurologists do is, is say where the problem is. And, and you know, that, that's what our training, training is. First saying, is it a neurological problem? And then where in the nervous system is the problem? Um, it's what we call our anatomic localization. And that's you know, what we go through our internships and residencies and, and, and practice doing day in and day out. So um, it, it's one of the fundamental questions of finding where the problem is so that we can say, well, what are the possible causes and what are the tests that help us find out what those possible causes um, are? So, um, so uh, a good neurological examination um, and practice is, is how we say where the, the, the neurological signs are coming from. Um, Uh, 
Uh, Mary remembered her third question. Um, could a pinched nerve in her spine have caused the two seizures instead of a brain issue? No. Um, so so that, that's where it comes down to uh, the previous question of how do we know where in the neurological system the problem is? Seizures tell us is the problem in the brain. You know, the, the a, a, a slip disc in the back is not going to cause a seizure. Um, similar to how, uh, how Dr. Seneca knew that degenerative myelopathy is not related to, you know, the cause of seizures. Um, degenerative myelopathy is, you know, at least at the very beginning and, you know, for, for the duration of most dogs course of degenerative myelopathy is a spinal cord problem. So and I, um, I was that because the, I, I, know, I know that I said maybe the, the proprioceptive deficit was because of something that's fine. So I think big picture here is that the proprioceptive deficit that you're seeing can be caused by something in the spine, but also can be caused by something in the brain. And that's where this kind of neuro localization is really important. So um, that's why there, there's, there are multiple possibilities here. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm looking through, I, I think we've covered all of the, all of the questions in the comments. Um, Jesse says, uh, we, we will, am I answering the right? It's about the Just, neuro exam video. Oh, um, we will upload the, the neuro exam, um, video. Yes, that's, that's, that's on its way. Um, all right. It's two o'clock. Thanks, Dr. Seneca. I appreciate you getting on. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.